Hey guys, and welcome to this week's episode of the Sports Sermon. I'm Jason Gandhi. I'm Dylan Staggy. I'm Dan Majors. And I'm Michael Bailey. And we are coming to you with an NBA free agency special. Free agency is just now coming to a close with just a few big guys left like LeBron and J.R. Smith and a few others who are expected to sign soon. But with that coming to a close, the one big headline besides Kevin Durant that came out was Derrick Rose saying, quote, with these teams right now, they're saying us and Golden State are the super teams, and they're trying not to build that many super teams, end quote. I thought that was kind of interesting. I think everyone was kind of surprised to hear Derrick Rose consider themselves on the same level as Golden State and saying that they're a super team. So, Michael, what do you think about Derrick Rose being a super te- being called a super team? Well, I think, you know, he's on a new team, and he's just trying to stick up for his team, you know. I don't know, maybe make his teammates feel better, you know, give them some confidence going into the season. But, you know, I don't think they're a super team at all. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think Derrick Rose, I think maybe if this was 2011, they'd be a super team, but not in 2016 when uh, Derrick Rose can't stay on the court and Joe Kim Noah's got his own issues. So, Let's go to the phones where we've got Christian Munson from Carmel, Indiana on the phone. Christian, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, guys. Yeah, thank you. So, what did you think of Derrick Rose's comments of the Knicks being a super team? Um, honestly, when I heard about it, I was kind of laughing because I was looking at the Knicks roster. I mean, they have Melo, who averages his 22 a game, but he doesn't pass. He doesn't share the ball, doesn't create opportunities, doesn't play defense. Uh, Porzingis, yeah, I mean, he's like a nice young talent looking – good for the future but he could still be a question mark he's only 19 or 20 years old uh i think like what you said maybe in 2011 the team could have been a super team i mean that's back when derrick rose was mvp but since then over the last four seasons he's only played 39 10 51 and 66 games uh steals were percentage dropping three point percentage dropping joking no i mean he's basically a non-factor he only averages four points a game and he hasn't been really healthy either so I'm not really seeing what D. Rose was talking about with him them being a super team. Yeah, I think one point that you brought up that's very, like, I agree with is the whole Chris Depps Prazingis argument. Everyone's acting like he's, like, the next superstar, and he's played one year. And so I definitely think you're spot on there with Chris Depps Prazingis is not the future, def- definitely, in New York. But another big headline was Kevin Durant leaving did you think that was a ring chaser move or a dedication to winning or what did you think about Kevin Durant going to Golden State I mean personally I wasn't a big fan of it I I thought that if he would have stayed in OKC they would have had the best team in the league especially with their move to get uh, Victor Oladipo DeMontis Sabonis and Ersan Iosova um, but for the Warriors obviously it's a great addition when you have the second best player in the league but, I mean, the Warriors already had the scoring, the three-point shooting, which he brings in the offense. Um, I'm not saying – I mean, obviously it's the best move of the offseason, but it'll be interesting to see how the shots go around, see that keeps everyone happy, if Steph can stay happy when he's not their number one guy anymore. And I honestly thought that the Warriors this offseason, was, offseason would maybe try to target some more players who are just really, really tough, like Draymond is. Steph and Clay aren't that type of player. Draymond, he's tough. He defends. He's their emotional leader. Um, so we'll have to see what adding KD does. I think they'll struggle right off the bat, but I think they'll get going and could possibly win another title. Yeah, uh, so when Miami teamed up for their big super team, you saw Chris Bosh, who was a pretty much star in the league, his production kind of drop and like him basically be an afterthought in that Miami Heat offense. Do you think that'll happen with Golden State? And if so, who do you think will have to be that afterthought? Um, I mean, I, I could see it happening. I mean, their their offense is so great to watch. They share the ball so well. Um, but if it does happen to someone, I think it'll be Clay because Durant's going to be taking most of his shots, I feel like. I think it's going to limit Clay to mainly more just a spot-up shooting role instead of him being um, a slasher and coming off picks like he did this past season. So I think Steph and Durant are really going to dominate uh, possession of the ball and take most of the shots. So I think that you might see a decrease in Clay's numbers, but he's still going to be just as great as great of a player. But, yeah, he could take on that role of being the kind of the Chris Bosh of the group. 
Yeah, I definitely, I would agree. If anyone was going to have to, I think it'd be Clay. Draymond brings so much. Honestly, I'd call him the leader of that team mentally, just the way he keeps everyone intact, maybe to a fault sometimes where he's very vocal, but I feel like he's the most vocal leader on that team. And Steph's going to Steph. And I think Kevin Durant comes in and maybe kicks Clay Thompson to the curb and makes him just kind of as an afterthought. But what was your personal favorite and least favorite free agency move? Um, well, obviously, it, I mean, it would be Durant, but outside of Durant, I tried to go out, outside the box a little bit here. Um, I really like what the Rockets did in bringing in Ryan Anderson and Eric Gordon. Uh, Anderson, you know, he's a stretch four, which is so valuable at this stage in the league, how everyone's trying to get smaller. Uh, really stretches the floor well, hits a three really well. I can see him doing some pick and pops with James Harden. I mean, he averaged 17 points a game last year, so I think that's a really big addition. And then with them bringing in uh, Eric Gordon, I mean, he's going to come in. I know his health has been a little bit of a concern, uh, but if he can start to get a lot more healthy, that would be huge for this team. He's a great three-point shooter. He can be a key secondary wing scorer behind Harden. He averaged 15 a game last year. Um, I think he'll pair up with Ariza well as their wing shooters. He helps space the floor for Harden to move. Um, so, yeah, I really like what the Rockets done, especially with them getting rid of Dwight Howard. Why do you like the Dwight Howard getting out of Houston so much? Um, you know, he's just, I thought that his personality, he's really a cancer in the locker room. Uh, on the floor, I mean, he's a solid uh, rebounder, can defend pretty well offensively. He can only score within, you know, about five feet. Um, late in the games, he can be kind of a liability with his free throw, free throw shooting. Um, that's why he was actually my uh, least favorite move of free agency was the Hawks signing him. Uh, they lost out on Al Horford to the Celtics, which I thought was huge. I thought that they should have put all of their money, or most of their free agency money, into Horford. Horford, I mean, when you look at him, he spaces the floor really well. He was great in those pick and pop situations with Jeff Teague and Dennis Schroeder. Uh, he's a good post score, rebounder, defender, and an overall team player. And when you look at Howard, like he, with fitting in with the Hawks, he does, he won't space the floor well. Uh, he can't do the pick and pop. Uh, he's like I said, he can't shoot free throws late in the game, and all, overall, he's just really going to hurt the locker room that that team had. And really, no free agents really want to play with Harden or uh, with Howard. Excuse me. You never see ever since he really left Orlando, no one really wants to go and pair up with Dwight Howard anymore. Yeah, I I definitely like what you said there for sure about Dwight Howard. And as a Laker fan, I can definitely agree that he is a cancer in the locker room, as you saw in 2012. Uh, I think it's funny that Dwight Howard is now, I know he wants to go play with him, and yet he was blaming it on Harden or uh, Kobe and all that. I think it's just very interesting how the t tables have turned and how it's nobody wants to go play with him. So thank you, Christian, for everything you've brought to this this week. Uh, give him a follow on Twitter at, at cmunson13. Thank you, Christian, for all you've brought today. All right, thanks for having me on, guys. See you later. Yep, see ya. All right, so guys, we'd love to have more guest callers. So if you want to be on the show, contact us at the Sports Sermon on Twitter, and we can definitely get you on the show. So we'd love to have any guest callers. And once again, thank you to Christian Munson for being on this podcast with us. But with that being said, let's see where each what each team gets at, for a grade for their offseason moves. And so let's move into the NBA offseason grades that we are going to do right now. The way that's going to work is we were all assigned certain teams drawn out of a hat, and now each person had to assign them a grade and an explanation. So we're going to get started here with Michael Bailey as he gives a grade and explanation for the Boston Celtics. All right, so this offseason, the uh, Celtics and Danny Ainge have been really productive. You know, first, you know, they tried all the resources to get KD. They even got Tom Brady and... David Ortiz trying to recruit how the city of Boston's, you know, championship mentality is just so great. But I really like their moves with Al Horford signing. That was really nice. And then in the draft, they got um, Ben Bentable, Jalen Brown, and then two other European prospects, you know, that they can store overseas. And then when they need them, they can just pop them back in. Uh, they also signed Gerald Green. And so overall, what they signed, I think it was really nice to help their team and I think that um, 
next season they're going to be maybe a top five team, maybe maybe even better. Some people think they're going to be right up there with the Cavs and uh, Pacers. I, I'm not too bought yet, though. Um, they did lose Solinger, which Solinger, one of my favorite players, you know, kind of sucks to see him leave. But overall, I think it was a really good um, offseason for them. I'm giving them an A grade. Okay, let's go to the Brooklyn Nets with Dan Majors. Dan, what'd you give the Brooklyn Nets? Um, I gave the Nets a C. Um, they signed four key guys: Jeremy Lin, Trevor Booker, Tyler Johnson, and Justin Hamilton. I like the signings; it helps build for the future. Uh, the trade of Thaddeus Young for a top twenty pick was all right. You got Chris LeVert out of it, but rebuilding is going to be tough especially when your first-round pick is sitting in Boston. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Their future is kind of shot with the one trade they made with Kevin Garnett and Jason Terry and all of the older guys that are almost now all, all out of the league. But let's go over to Dylan, who's got the New York Knicks, who made definitely a splash. Dylan, what do you think about the New York Knicks? I'm going to give them a B for their offseason this year. Obviously, they traded for Derrick Rose, signed Joakim Noah and Courtney Lee, and re-signed Lance Thomas to a kind of expensive contract, paying him about 7 to $8 million a year. And these are all good moves, which are going to put them in contention in the crazy wide-open East, which they could be anywhere from a 3 to 8 seed. But it's kind of a winner bust, as these moves are not going to set them up for a future. So that's why I'm giving them a B. They'll definitely have a solid team this year and be able to make the playoffs in the East. But their future is not looking too bright after a few years with this team. So, yeah, uh, what did you think about the whole super team as you had the Knicks? What did you think about those comments? They're definitely not a super team. They do not have a lot of depth on this team. And a lot of their players just are not very healthy, very injury prone. And who knows if they can stay healthy. All right, so I've got the Philadelphia 76ers who are just trying to trust the process here a little bit. And I'm going to give them a B plus. I thought their offseason moves were pretty solid, drafting the best player in the draft, Ben Simmons, at number one, pretty easy choice. But then getting two solid international prospects in the draft of Timothy Luwawu and Firkin Korkmaz, I think those two guys could be potential great bench or great scores off the bench for the Sixers in a few years. And I also loved the signing of Jared Bayless for the Sixers. Yeah, it sounds weird because Jared Bayless isn't a big name, but I think it's a perfect fit for the Sixers because they want Simmons to be the man that brings the ball up and is in control. And Jared Bayless is technically a point guard, but Brett Brown has talked how he doesn't really need to bring the ball up and how he's okay playing off the ball and getting his shots up a different way. So I think Bayless is the perfect short-term compliment, as Simmons is definitely the future. So I give the Philadelphia 76ers a B plus. But let's go to Michael again, who's got the Toronto Raptors. Michael? All right. So the Raptors this offseason, they drafted Jakob Podol, Pascal Siakam, and they've also got young talent coming up in the D League, like Bruno Caboclo. And I think those young guys are definitely going to make for a future. Personally, I was watching the, um, dra- uh, the Summer League with the Raptors, and they, they were playing really well. And I think those young guys definitely have a future. And I love the re-signing of DeMar DeRozan. He's obviously their star. And then they uh, signed a role player, like Jared Sollinger, one of my favorite players. But they did lose a key name in Bismack Biombo. He, um, he had a big season last year, but they obviously didn't think he was worth the money that he got. And I kind of agree with them. So, I mean, if they don't like that, then they let him walk, which I understand. So I'm going to give him a grade of B. All right, I like the B. I think that's a perfect fit for the Toronto Raptors as they got DeMar back but did lose Bismack Biombo. Dan? You have the Chicago Bulls, who made a lot of free agent signings, including Dwayne Wade. What did you think about the Chicago Bulls offseason? Um, I gave them a B plus. I think that they're kind of hard to analyze with three guards that are all going to be starting, probably. Um, I guess you could put Jimmy Butler at the forward, but post-play will struggle. Um, but they did put themselves in a much better position to do some damage in the playoffs. Then the key here is that you got to remember the best player is actually on the bench. 
Jerry Grant, man, he has a lot of potential, and he's the Summer League Finals MVP. So, yeah, Bulls, B+. Plus. Did you just call Jerry and Grant their best player? Yes, I did. I don't think Dwayne Wade's going to like the hearing that Jerry and Grant is the Bulls' best player. You heard it here first. Dan's bold prediction. We're definitely going to have to quote that and make sure everyone knows that Dan just called Jerry and Grant, the Chicago Bulls, best player. But let's go over to Dylan, who's got the Cleveland Cavaliers. Well, the Cavs are a little bit hard to grade in this offseason so far because they have literally done nothing so far. They did lose Matt Delvedova and Timothy Moskov, though, losing a little bit of depth on their bench, but they obviously could not afford the 100 plus million dollars they got combined. LeBron has said that he will re-sign with them, though, and their off-season grade in the end will really depend on if they get J.R. Smith back and how good a deal they get him for. But for now, their for their moves, I'll have to give them a B minus. Do you think it's a guarantee that they get J.R. and LeBron back? I think LeBron's pretty safe to say because no one could afford him. But J.R., do you think it's a pretty safe bet that he's going back to the Cavs? I think so. I don't. I don't think any other team will really want to pay him what he's asking for for about fifteen million. I don't think any other team has the money or the need to do that. All right. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. I was just curious on what you were thinking. Okay, let's go over to. I've got the Detroit Pistons, and in the draft, I thought they got good value getting Ellenson at eighteen because he was valued as a lottery pick. I don't. I personally am not a fan of him. But a lot of analysts put him as a lottery pick value. So I thought that was good value, getting Ellenson at 18. And then they also drafted Michael, I'm going to butcher this last name, Gabinji from Syracuse. I didn't love or hate the pick. It was just okay. I didn't think much of it. He played well in Summer League. So maybe he's got a future with the Pistons. But I think this grade comes into play where you look at the free agent signings, where they signed Ish Smith, who is okay, nothing special. But then John Luer and Boban Marjanovic. I think they overpaid very much for Luer and Marjanovic. They paid Luer four year forty two million dollar contract when he's only when he's average in his career, five point six points per game and three point five rebounds. So in my opinion, he is not worth just under twelve million per year. And it's ju- or just under eleven million per year, excuse me. And it's just a little absurd in my opinion. I think Marjanovic, they could have gotten a little cheaper as they had to, they have to pay him $7 million a year. I don't hate it as much as Luer, but I feel like if they could have waited, if they would have waited, they could have gotten Luer much cheaper and maybe gotten Marjanovic for a little cheaper. So all in all, I'd give the Pistons a C-. minus. But let's go to Michael, who's got his hometown team, the Indiana Pacers. All right, so my favorite team, the Indiana Pacers, Larry Bird made a bunch of moves this offseason. I think they're one of the most improved teams, but that's just opinion-based and obviously a little biased. Starting off, they traded Thad Young for the 20th pick, which, you know, 20th pick, you're not going to find anything too special. Occasionally, you're going to get a gem. But I like the trade. Thad Young is an immediate um, role player to help them make a push for the Eastern Conference um, Finals, maybe even the uh, NBA Finals, for all I know. Um, then they also acquired Jeff Teague um, from the Atlanta Hawks, which I think is a huge upgrade from George Hill. He lacks, I mean, George Hill's better than Jeff Teague in some parts of the game, but overall, I'd rather have Jeff Teague on my team than George Hill. Next, they signed Al Jefferson and Aaron Brooks, which are two veterans that's going to, you know, that's going to help their team down the road, and it's going to... Um, help their depth, and I think um, they're going to make a really good push for the uh, NBA Finals. All right. I definitely like what you said about Jeff Teague and George Hill. I know there's been a lot of different people weighing in on Teague and George Hill and who they like more, but I think I'd agree with you that Jeff Teague is definitely an upgrade over George Hill. Uh, Let's go over to Dan, who's got the Milwaukee Bucks. Yeah, i I got to give the Bucks a B. Um, They lost some key guys that found just as good, if not better, players to fill those positions. Matthew Delavidova can easily replace Jared Bayless at point guard. Delhi is maybe more well-rounded. 
Then they got Thon Maker and Malcolm Brogdon in the draft. So, future looks great for the Milwaukee Bucks. Damn, what are your thoughts on Thon Maker? I feel like he's a little overhyped now because of his big summer league play. What do you think about Thon Maker? Well, there's all that, like, controversy on whether what his age is and stuff. But from what I've seen in his highlights, he looks good. But, I mean, you're, you're taking a little bit of a risk here, but... Yeah, he's not that bad. All right, let's go over to Dylan, <laughs> who's got the Atlanta Hawks with their big free agent signing of Dwight Howard. The Hawks have definitely had an interesting offseason getting Dwight Howard and Jarrett Jack in free agency, and they traded away Jeff Teague to get the draft pick so they could draft Tory and Prince. They re-signed Kent Bazemore, a little bit more expensive than his market value, and lost Al Horford. And I think they could have been a playoff team if they would have kept Teague, if they would have had Teague, Millsap, and Dwight Howard. But signing Howard makes them seem a little bit desperate to go to the playoffs, even though they most likely, even though they most likely won't. And now they're kind of stuck in an awkward position. They'll probably be a bubble team on the playoffs and trying to maybe rebuild and contend at the same time. So I'm going to give the Hawks a C for their offseason, not looking too hot. Yeah, I. you heard Christian say it earlier in this, and I've got to say the same thing. I do not like the Dwight Howard signing at all. I get it's his hometown, but I think this year is going to be a very big year for Dwight Howard's career in a negative way that hopefully he starts to realize he cannot be the number one guy on a championship contending team. But let's move to the Charlotte Hornets who I've got, and I gave them a B-plus for their offseason. They actually had zero draft picks, and they made all their moves with free agency and trades. They traded the draft rights of Malachi Richardson to the Kings for Marco Bellinelli, who Bellinelli had a lot of shooting depth. They re-signed Nicholas Batum and Marvin Williams, got Brian Roberts back, and they signed Ramon Sessions. So the reason I gave them a B-plus I think Nicholas Batum and Marvin Williams may be a bit pricey, but the value they bring to that Hornets team was... I uh, <clears throat> The value they bring is just... I don't even know like, the word. Like he, They just mean so much to that team, and they really cannot be replaced with the way Batum brings such versatility, and Marvin Williams the same thing, where he can play the 2, 3, or 4, and Batum can, stay, can go inside or kick it out. And so I think those two are great signings. Bellinelli adds depth, and so do Sessions and Roberts. And the one thing that would have that changed it from A- minus to B+, plus was that they lost Jeremy Lin to Brooklyn. I think, yeah, they made it up with Sessions and Roberts, but Jeremy Lin was coming off a pretty decent year for him b- besides the year in New York with Lin Sanity. But I think if they could have re-signed Lin, that would have made them maybe a top five, top six playoff seed contender for sure. But I think all in all, they'll make the playoffs. And they didn't need the pick, made the most of their free agency, and that's why they get a B-plus for the offseason. But let's go to the Miami Heat, where Michael has got the Miami Heat, who lost Dwayne Wade, but did get some other guys. Michael? Well, um, this offseason, Pat Riley, I think surprised a lot of people when he let you Wade walk like that, which I think, you know, I don't know, it's it was a bad move for him, you know. I know he let a lot of fans down and probably let D Wade down, but D Wade returning to his home hometown, which you can't really blame him for wanting to go home. Um, but they kept Hassan Whiteside and they signed Derek Williams, which I actually kind of like this uh, Derek Williams signing. He actually had a decent season in New York, which New York is New York, but I think he um, he might contribute on a team team that's gonna probably struggle next year. They did sign Deion Waiters to one year one year deal. But um, losing D. Wade really, really makes this, like, a bad offseason for them, I think. Because, you know, he's been there for the past, what, 12 years or something like that. So I'm going to have to give him a B-, minus, maybe even a C plus, But I'm going to say B- minus because I'm a, I'm a lenient guy. <laughs> All righty. Let's go to Dan, who's got the Orlando Magic. Made a lot of moves over there in Orlando. Dan? Yeah, i got to give the uh, Orlando Magic a C. They got some solid players, and Bismack Biombo, Sergi Barca, and Jeff Green. I'm not sure how minutes will be shared with Aaron Gordon, Biombo, and Ibaka all on the same team. 
same with guard play. Not sure how Peyton, Fournier, Meeks, and Hazonia, along with other guys, how they will share playing time. But this talent could help with a rebuilding process, though. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Let's go over to Dylan with the Washington Wizards. Dylan? The Wizards made a few moves this offseason. First off, they re-signed Bradley Beal to a max contract. If he stays healthy, that could work out okay for them. And they also signed Ian Mahinmi, who was very expensive. A four-year, $64 million deal, and he'll actually be making more money than John Wall next season. They signed Andrew Nicholson, which was a decent signing, and Trey Burke, who they got through trade, was a steal, trading him, getting him for a 2021 second-round draft pick. But there's really not enough talent on the Wizards to justify an almost $100 million salaries that they'll be paying out next season. So I'll give them a C plus since with all their expensive moves, they probably will not be able to make the playoffs. Do you? I saw that Scott Brooks came out, I think it was yesterday or the day before, and said that John Wall and Bradley Beal might be the best two-way backcourt in the NBA right now. What do you think about that? I think they're close, but definitely not the top. I mean, you can't really beat Steph and Clay right now with all the three-pointers. They're just splashing. Speaking of Steph and Clay, let's go to Michael, who's got the biggest, the biggest team in free agency, the Golden State Warriors. Well, the Warriors certainly uh, made a big splash, brothers. Um, <laughs> but they got KD, which is you know the biggest move this whole year in sports, maybe. Um, so KD was a huge signing. They um, four superstars now. that definitely got a big four with Draymond, Clay, Steph, and KD. But it's gonna be weird to see how they share the shot. You know, because Clay, Steph, and KD all take a bunch of shots. So, you know, that's going to be interesting watching them. But they did um, also pick up David West, which is a veteran. They signed him for the veteran minimum. But I think it was a really good signing uh, for them. It'll help experience. And David West really wants to win a championship. And he thought that that'd be the best place. So I think that he'll help out the Warriors. And um, they did lose Harrison Barnes, Andrew Bogut, and Festus Azili, which. Those are three players that may not have been the biggest contributors last season, but they still contributed a good amount. And why ruin something that's um, that's already won a championship and already um, made the NBA Finals? Like why ruin that? But they got KD, so I guess I guess it's all good for them. Um, so overall, I would say it's a B plus. I'm not saying A minus or A because I'm not too big of a fan of the KD move because they did lose three role players that really helped their team out last season. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Christian. Do you see someone falling into the Chris Bosh role? And if so, who is it? Um, I would have to agree with Christian and say Clay Thompson. Uh, because, you know, Draymond, he'll do his thing. Steph will do his thing. But Clay could lose a little, not stardom, but he could lose a little, not minutes, uh, shots. And that could lead to um, definitely less points per game and less of uh, the slasher role, like Christian said. All right, thanks, Michael. Let's go over to Dan, who's got the Phoenix Suns. Danny? Yeah, um, I got to give the Suns a B. They didn't really do much in free agency. They did most of the work in the draft. Got Dragon Bender, Marquise Chris, and a steal in Tyler Ulis. All three players have great potential and a chance to get some solid minutes this season. So get these guys developed and you're looking at a bright future. All right. Short, sweet, and I like it. I don't know if I can call Dragon Bender part of the future. I was never big on his game. Looking at his stats over in, over, over in the overseas league, I don't know. I can't get up about Dragon Bender. But I do like Marquise Chris and I do like Tyler Ulis. So I think the Suns are starting to get a future going. Dylan, your team, the Los Angeles Clippers, who are looking at a new venue, thankfully, so they can get out of the Lakers' gym. But what did you think about the Clippers' offseason moves? Well, it may be a little bit biased, but I'm going to give them a B-plus for this offseason. They re-signed Jamal Crawford, Austin Rivers, and Wes Johnson for three years apiece. I just Rivers like to say, and Johnson I'm sorry. Both a little bit expensive, 
and they did lose Jeff Green this offseason, but there is no way to pay him as he got a one-year $15 million deal with the Magic. Bryce Johnson and Diamond Stone were both solid picks in the draft, but what really makes me give them the B-plus is the signings of Raymond Felton, Maurice Bates, and Brandon Bass, all to minimum deals. Those are both, Those were, all three of those were just great deals, great veterans to come in and help the team off the bench. And I believe the Clippers could finish second in the West next year, competing with the Warriors and the Spurs up there for the top three. Yeah, I just like to apologize as a clip for, as you for you as a Clipper fan for this upcoming year that you'll have to watch three more years of Austin Rivers. So I apologize for your loss. But let's move to the Los Angeles Lakers, my team, and I've actually got them. So the Los Angeles Lakers, like Dylan said, it might be a bit biased. But I looked around other websites, and they had around the same range of a grade that I did. And so I gave the Los Angeles Lakers a B plus. If I was doing just a draft grade, I would 100% give them an A+. Plus. I think they got great value getting Ivica Zubac at 32 when a lot of teams had him in the top 15, top 20 on their draft board. And I loved the Brandon Ingram pick. It was the obvious but right choice for the Los Angeles Lakers. So if it was just the draft, I'd give them an A. But... Honestly, in free agency, I like the moves they made too, except for one. Timofey Mozgov, I don't mind him coming, but I have an issue with him being our number one target off of free agency and how much money we paid him. I truly believe if we would have waited, we could have got him tonight, July 27th, for about $10 million, not per year, altogether, and we could have had him on our team, but instead we got antsy and took Mozgov on the first night. So that's the only deal I really had an issue with, just because of how early and how much money. But I like Dang, great mentor. I think maybe a little pricey, but still I think it's worth it if you're going to be able to mentor Brandon Ingram. I think Zubac and Ingram both fill two needs, as we were in desperate need of a center. And Calderon, who we traded for, as well as Tarek Black and Marcelo Huertas, add good depth. And Jordan Clarkson, my favorite signing for the Lakers, I think he was a bargain to re-sign because he really couldn't re-sign for much because of the whole second round thing and the Gilbert Arenas rule, basically. And I think he's going to be a key part of the future. So all in all, Timothy Mozgov was the only questionable one. But besides that, I thought the offseason was pretty successful. And I think the Lakers definitely have a good future to build on and can be back in the playoffs in a year or two. So I'll give them a B plus. But let's go. I, I actually got to stay with this one. I've got the Sacramento Kings to round out the Pacific Division. They made a lot of interesting moves, to say the least. I gave them a C, just an average grade. In the draft, they drafted Georges Papianis. They traded for the rights to Malachi Richardson. Then they drafted Scal Labissere and Isaiah Cousins. Through free agency, they got Matt Barnes, Aaron Aflalo, Anthony Tolliver, and Garrett Temple. I like the signing of, or not the signing, the drafting of Isaiah Cousins and Malachi Richardson. I think it brings two good jump shooters to that Kings team who are in desperate need of some shooting, as well as the signing of Aflalo. But the issue I have is, according to ESPN's projected roster for next year, the Kings are going to have four centers on their roster, and honestly, probably five. They've got DeMarcus Cousins, Willie Cauley-Stein, Papi Giannis, Kufis, and they list Labissere as a power forward, but I look at him as more of a center as he's 6'11". But the reason they're not completely low is because they they got Dave Yorger as a coach who took a team of basically a bunch of scrubs and brought them to the playoffs last year for the Grizzlies. So I'd give the Kings an average grade of just about a C. So let's go to Michael, who's got the Houston Rockets. Michael? Well, the Houston Rockets, they did sign Eric Gordon and Brian Anderson. Like like Christian said, Brian Anderson, um, great stretch four, which is hard to come by in this NBA. They re-signed James Harden, and they lost Dwight Howard, which I think, like Christian, it was a good thing they lost, that, that, that they lost Dwight Howard. So I think it was a good offseason overall. So I'm going to give him a B plus. I like that. I agree. Dwight Howard was a good guy to get rid of. Dan, what about your favorite team, the Dallas Mavericks? Well, I got to give the Mavericks a B minus here. They got two solid guys with Bogan and Barnes, but the problem with the Mavs is that they're a win now team, and 
you they're only going to be a win now team for about two more years and, until Dirk retires. So they needed a top free agent to do something big this next season. I like getting Barnes, who averaged 12 a game and shot 47 percent from the field. I actually don't care how how expensive he was. He can help build for when Dirk's on. But nothing was made to excuse me. But nothing was made to create a title contending team. Yeah, uh, I thought it was interesting you did not mind the Harrison Barnes tra- uh, signing. I know a lot of people did, thought it was too much money, but you're good with Harrison Barnes coming to the Mavericks? I am, because, I mean, the Mavs aren't going to be spending much money after Dirk's gone, because there's nobody to do because they're not going to be wanting to come to Dallas, so I like it. All right. Dylan, you've got the Memphis Grizzlies. Bunch of scrubs making the playoffs last year. What do you think about the Grizzlies this year? Well, the Grizzlies definitely did have an interesting offseason, throwing a lot of money around, obviously re-signing Mike Conley to the biggest contract in NBA history, and also signing Chandler Parsons in free agency to a max deal. They did have some solid rookie pickups in Wade Baldwin, Deontay Davis, and Troy Williams. And they will have a, star, a very good starting five in Mike Conley, Tony Allen, Chandler Parsons, Zach Randolph, and Marcus Saul next season. But they have almost no depth in the in, on the bench next year. They threw out way too much money, which will bite them in on in the butt down the road for only being a team that will probably be on the playoff bubble for a few years. Do you think they squeeze into the playoffs this year? I think they'll be able to make a 7 or 8 seed, but they won't be going anywhere. All right. Well, I've got the New Orleans Pelicans, and they drafted Buddy Heald and Chuck Diallo, and they signed Solomon Hill, each one more, Langston Galloway, Alonzo Gee, and Tim Frazier. And I gave them a C- minus because I really thought Solomon Hill and each one more were definitely overpaid. As Solomon Hill and each one more both are going to get right around ninety million combined over the next four years, like both of them, not each of them. Those two combined, they're going to get paid ninety million dollars. Where it's just they they were two role players on decent teams last year, and now they're paying them starter money. So that was really a surprise to me, and I am not a fan of Buddy Heald. I think he was a good player in college, a great player in college, but I don't know if his game can translate. He looks to me like another Jimmer for debt, and we all know where he is. Maybe I'm wrong, and people can call me on it, but I am not a fan of Buddy Heald, so I gave them a C-. minus. Let's go over to Michael, who's got the San Antonio Spurs. Well, the Spurs offseason is just kind of normal. They picked up Pau Gasol, but they did lose, you know, a really key franchise star, Timmy D., um, you know, uh, I think his time is over. He's been slowing down, so letting him walk isn't the worst thing. Well, him choosing to leave the NBA isn't the worst thing because his time, you know, has come. And then David West they lost to, which he didn't do too much for them, but he still was a role player. But the addition of Pau Gasol is going to put them to a B grade from me. All right. I think it's going to be a weird league next year without Kobe and Tim Duncan, to say the least. Let's go over to Dan, who's got the Denver Nuggets. Uh, I got the Nuggets with a B plus. Um, I like what they did. Tons of bright talent has made its way to Denver. Didn't do much in free agency, but picked up Malik Beasley. Excuse me if I get this wrong. Juancho Hernan Gomez and Jamal Murray in the draft. Um, those guys, along with Moody and Harris, could be huge for the future. So, yeah, I like what Denver did. Yeah, they had a lot of draft picks, and I feel like they made the most of them, getting some draft and stash and getting some good guys that can contribute now. But let's go to Dylan, who's got the Minnesota Timberwolves, one of the up-and-coming teams of the next few years. The Timberwolves did not do too much in free agency this offseason, only signing Jordan Hill and Cole Aldridge in free agency. But their draft was fantastic. They got Chris Dunn, who I think was a steal at number five. And I think him, Andrew Wiggins, and Carl Anthony Towns will be able to form a big three in a few years. So 
not much going for the Timberwolves this offseason. We'll have to give them a B-plus because I love the Chris Dunn pick. Well, with Chris Dunn coming, I agree. I think he could be one of the stars of this league in a few years. What does that look like for Ricky Rubio? Um, I'm not really sure. I think uh, Chris Dunn could maybe play the two with Ricky Rubio at point guard, but I don't, I'm not sure how well they'll fit together. So I think maybe down the line in a couple of years, Ricky Rubio could potentially be traded. Okay, well, I've got the Oklahoma City Thunder, and we all know what happened in their free agency. They lost their future of their franchise and their franchise now and Kevin Durant. I gave them a D minus because there's whether it's really their fault or not, you cannot say they had a good offseason when you lose a top three player in the league that you've had your his whole career. So I gave them a D minus. I did like what they did with Ola Depot. I think that's a good fit, but there's really not much else to say besides they lost a top three player in the league and now they're gonna have to be able to come back with something of a form of a playoff team, hopefully, for them. But I think the big question for them is, do you trade Russell Westbrook? And that comes down to, what do you think's going to happen next year? Because the worst thing they could do is keep him and him go somewhere else, and then you lose back-to-back stars and get nothing in return for them. So I think if you don't give him, a, if he hasn't agreed to a max deal this year before the season starts, you trade him by the deadline because the well, the last thing you could do is lose two stars and get nothing in return. So I give the Oklahoma City Thunder a D minus for losing Kevin Durant for agency. Let's go with the last two teams we've got: the tra- Portland Trailblazers that Michael's got. Michael, what do you think about the Portland Trailblazers? Well, the Portland Trailblazers, they re-signed C.J. McCollum, which was a big one, and then um, Mo Harkless, which I think, you know, they're they're rebuilding, and they're trying to build around, you know, um, Dame and C.J. McCollum, which I think those those are two really good young, soon-to-be stars, and Dame's already a star. And so, you know, their offseason was just kind of average, so I'm just going to give them a B-. I like that great. I think Dame and CJ McCollum are definitely the future. They re-signed Crab, Harkless, and a few other guys. And yeah, I thought the Trailblazers really surprised a lot of people getting into the playoffs last year. And they lost four of their five starters. But let's go to the last team that we're going to grade. The 30th team. Definitely not the worst team, though. The Utah Jazz. Up and coming with some young talent. Danny? Yeah, I got to give the Jazz an A. Um, Utah needed veteran leadership badly. And they got that with George Hill, Boris Vial, and Joe Johnson. Hill will most likely start, and you can say this guy is underrated, averaging 12 points per game and shot 44% last season. He's a great leader also. Now they've got guys that can easily come off the bench and fill some holes with a young talent. I loved what Utah did here, and this could really change this franchise around. All right, so that's all 30 teams that have been graded. I, we hope you enjoyed that. And before we get to the closing with the Sports Bible, we're going to go around to each person, and you guys are going to tell us what's your favorite move of free agency as it comes to a close and why. Michael, we're going to start with you. Well, my favorite move was Al Horford to the Celtics. I think, you know, he's one of the stars in the NBA, and it really helped the Celtics to push them to a contender. And I think he's going to fit well with Isaiah Thomas and uh, Jay Crowder and that young team that they're building there. So that was my favorite move. Yeah, I agree with that. I think Al Horford was a great fit for the Celtics team. My personal favorite move is kind of an under-the-radar one. I like Al Jefferson to the Pacers. I think he's going to come in and be a leader of the second unit, and he's a scorer, he's a veteran, and he can mentor Miles Turner. And I think he's going to be a great piece for the next three years to help get these young guys ready so that way when his, his time is done, the Pacers franchise is in a great spot. I think he's a perfect fit for the Indiana Pacers. Dylan, what was your favorite move? Well, I mean, it was technically a signing, not for free agency, though. But Chris Dunn to the Timberwolves is my favorite move. I said it earlier, and I just love the draft pick at number five. I think they should have taken it at number three. So the Timberwolves got him, and with him, Wiggins, and Carl Anthony Towns, like I said, they'll be able to form a big three within the next few years, and the Timberwolves should be on their way to a lot of successful seasons in the future. 
All right, and Dan, finally, what was your favorite off-season move made by an NBA team this 2016 year? Well, I got to go with um, Paul Gasol from the Spurs. Two years, 30 mil. Um, the Spurs just lost once-in-a-lifetime player Tim Duncan. Not saying Gasol is going to fill that fill that position, but this is a crucial player that led the league in double doubles in the 2014-2015 season. So I think that's the best move the Spurs could have gotten without getting Durant. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a great uh, decision there with going with Paul Gasol. But that's all the NBA we're going to have, so let's throw it over to Michael for this week's Sports Bible Quote. All right, so this week's sports uh, Bible quote is from Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You can't win unless you learn to lose. So in the off season, you know, you lose some guys, you get some guys, but it's all about taking risks to find the gems in the draft and to sign the players that hopefully can be worth more than what you signed them for. So you need to take risks and um, rebuild through the um, off season if you lose. So I think this was a good quote to sum up the off season. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, so, so make sure you follow us on Twitter um, at the Sports Sermon, Sports Sermon with the or Sports with the Z. And Jason. Yeah, like you said, make sure you follow us. And it's been a great episode. So once again, thank you to Christian Munson for coming on as a guest. And if you guys want to be a guest. Make sure you guys come contact us in some way and let us know. We'd love to have you. Great episode, guys. It's been fun. So for the last time, I'm Jason Gandhi. I'm Dylan Staggy. I'm Dan Majors. And I'm Michael Bailey. And it's been a great NBA free agency. Hopefully our teams can get back to the playoffs and hopefully one of them can win a championship. Thank you to all of our listeners and follow us on Twitter at the Sports Sermon Sports of the Z. Thanks, guys.